Today on Landry.audio, MMA and UFC referee Steve Percival. Uh, when I moved to Australia in 2004 and trained out of Elvis Sinisic and Anthony Parash's gym uh, in Concord in Sydney, I bumped into Steve Percival for various gradings and seminars during that period going back, what, about 15 years. Back then, he was the Australian distributor for Atama Geese. Later on, he ended up refereeing the two professional fights I had under the CFC banner. And he has since become one of the top referees for mixed martial arts, working globally for a range of organizations, uh, including the UFC. So, Steve, how are you going today? I'm going great. Thanks, Jess. How are you? Yeah, good. It's just uh, before we turn on the mic, we've just sort of been talking for what, probably about a half hour, just trying to think of a few stories and, and talking a little bit about the, the origins of the Australian scene, which I think will probably be a good portion uh, of the interview because you've, you've been around for a while, haven't you? Yeah, 57 years, mate. <laughs> Is that what you meant, or did you mean in MMA? <laughs> oh, look, I, I didn't want to put your age out there, but in, in terms of talking about that, you know, um, even when we talk about MMA, uh, you come from an era prior to that. So it's probably a good place to kick off. We'll talk about your refereeing experience, but uh, everyone's got a story. So, you know, where does yours begin in terms of how you get into martial arts and all that stuff? Okay, I first started martial arts back in 1977, um, and it was just a friend. Uh, we always talked about martial arts, and he said, listen, I've seen this really cool martial art where they wear black geese, and that was a big deal. And um, so I went along to this martial art, which was called Hapkido. Not many people know it. It's a Korean style, and I fell in love with it straight away. And it was pretty much a mixed martial art then, um, to be honest. You know, there's break falls, throws, locks, uh, some weaponry, kicking, punching. There was a bit of everything. And I fell in love with that straight away and started training in that. Um, of course, then I, then I uh, left that briefly, had a family, and then resumed in that and uh, went through and got my black belt in that before – searching for other styles and found BJJ. Cool. Uh, when we talk about that sort of time period for, you know, I, I'm not young, but I'm a couple decades younger than you. you the, the perception that we saw in all those sort of 80s karate films and stuff is is uh, dominated by things like dojo storms and challenge matches and all this sort of stuff. Is there any truth to that or, or what was sort of the experience of doing martial arts uh, during that time period? Well, I, I never saw any of that, but I definitely heard of it. Um, the master I had, uh, Master Matthew Kim, um, he worked at, at, uh, for corrective services at one stage. He was a brutally tough man, and uh, I would have found it very difficult to believe anyone could just storm his gym. Um, he, he had a lot of people, a lot of black belts under other styles join his gym just because he was so tough and so so good at what he did um but i did hear of stories where there was gym storming and um yeah so there, there was quite a bit of that going around too and, and what was it like training in that time period you know as you said we you know we, we hear about how hard uh, you know, people used to be in, in the decades before. So was, was the training, um, its implementation, was there, was it predominantly kata or was it still based around sparring and fighting each other during the, the class? Well, in, Hap in Hapkido, I went into the, I went into the school and believe it or not, the, the uniforms we wore, the geese, were uh, handmade by his mother. So, yeah, it was kind of weird because, you know, some geese would have a crutch that would hang down to the knees and other geese would be super tight crutch. Um, but, you know, the gym was on a wooden floor. We had to sweep the gym before we trained. It had a big canvas-covered horsehair mat. Um, the, 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 the bags had sand in them, so if you kick the bottom of the bag, you break your foot. Um, and as I said, he was just brutally tough. So when he threw you, 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 you had to break fall. Otherwise you was coughing up, you know, coughing up a lung. Um, and he, he, it was just a tough, hard training session. Um, we used to spar regularly and there was contact in the sparring at white belt. Um, but you know, yeah, it was just, it was just a tougher days training on wooden floors. You know, your push ups are on your knuckles on your wooden floors. There were no jigsaw mats, nothing like that. And um, as I said, it was, yeah, it was tough. So we're, we're break falling onto hardwood. Uh, no, we did have, a, as I said, a horsehair canvas-covered mat. 
uh, which we may as well have fallen onto the hardwood because this thing wasn't very soft at all. And, and, um, so that was, this, that was, that was our beginning. So I remember lining up with 20, 20 students one day while Matthew threw us. And, uh, as we, as we kept on lining up, a few people would drop out, a few people would drop out. And then there was about five of us in this line while everyone else was sitting out because he'd slammed them so hard. Mm, okay. One, once we start getting into, uh, well, I guess the, the, the time frame is a little bit convoluted. So prior to the, the UFC, which is, uh, I guess really the, the global phenomenon that introduces BJJ, there are still organizations, um, you know, that are running for a few years beforehand, like Shudo. What do you remember of that time period in the early 1990s about, you know, the, the onset of, uh, I, it was called No Holds Barred at that point in time? What, what do you remember sort of hitting first? Um, well, the shooter was around and uh, people like Larry Papadopoulos were involved in that. And then um, one of the black belts in Sydney, Anthony Lange, was I- involved in that. And um, there were quite a few guys running around doing that. Uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a massive fan of it. Um, but, you know, once UFC hit, even then, even then with the, the early UFCs coming from a martial arts background, it was like, you know, holy crap, he just kicked the guy in the head while he was on the ground. That, you can't do that. You know, that's not, that's not very nice. Um, but once you, once you got past that and you just started loving the fights and just saying that, you know, style versus style was such an interesting concept and, uh, that stand up styles like karate, kung fu and hapkido for sure were, um, we're just not versed well on the ground, you know. We just weren't we weren't skilled on the ground, and it was just horrible to watch us getting beaten up like that. It it, it was a uh, it was a a shock to reality for a lot of martial arts that I guess thought that they were tough without actually playing in there at at the time when we're talking in that sort of uh, mid nineties period as it's growing. What what did you see? Did a lot of schools acknowledge the fact that they needed to change? Because since then, it's gone back the other way, where a lot of schools have just gone back to, oh, we're too deadly for this sort of stuff, or <laughs> our strikes are still better than that. And it sort of reverted back to that, um, I guess, the mythology of it. But when the UFC was arriving, w- w- were people in the martial arts scene a- a- acknowledging that uh, that this was the real thing? No, no. Everybody, uh, you know, back in those days, you got to think, uh, martial arts instructors wouldn't allow their students to cross train at all. Um, it was a, a taboo to, to go to another gym and cross train. And so, you know, they, because they always believed that their style was the best and, and they did never ever wanted to be embarrassed by another style. And, uh, so once uh, the UFC came along and exposed this, and, and I, and same thing, I'm in Hapkido and I'm a Hapkido traditionalist too. You, you know, once, once it was exposed, I, I, I personally went, wow, I think this is really good. I, I would like to learn this, this ground fighting stuff. But nearly everybody come out and said, well, if that was happening to me, if that guy tried to take me down like that, I would elbow his head, I would knee him in the head and, and just, they had no idea. They basically had no idea what would happen once they got on the ground uh, as neither did I, but I, 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 uh, I looked at it and I went, well, I want to learn that. That's something completely different. And what, what options became av- available? So did, for, for people listening, the two sort of original names that I remember from Australian BJJ were John Will as part of the dirty dozen and Anthony Lange. Do you want to just, what do you remember about them and your relationship with them? And I guess the introduction of BJJ into Australia. Okay. Well, originally, um, I, I was, I was teaching Hapkido in Campbelltown with, uh, with my, uh, friend and partner, Michael Scott then. And, uh, a guy just came in, he watched the class and he, he then introduced himself afterwards. And we actually became friends and he was training in Jeet Kune Do. That's, uh, Bruce Lee style. And he just, he just talked to us about grappling and ground fighting. And so I just went, okay, let's, let's play a bit of this stuff. And, um, you know, he was sticking his elbow in pressure points and things like that, making me squirm and, and just having absolutely no problem with me whatsoever. And so I started to uh, basically train with this guy a little bit, trying to learn more and more. 
And then he introduced me, he introduced me to, um, his, his instructor, Walt Missingham. And I did a couple of classes over there, which was a, another eye opener for me coming from a traditional background. And, and, uh, then I heard of this seminar, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu seminar coming up. And it was a, pretty much, I think the first one in New South Wales. And it was with a very famous Jiu Jitsu black belt by the name of Carlos Gracie Jr. Um, and so what so year are we talking about now? Uh, 1995. 95. Okay. Yeah. 1995. So I went along to that seminar and he brought, I think, two other black belts out with him. And he just, he said, who does grappling styles? And, you know, all these judo black belts put up their hands and, you know, a few guys that were dabbling in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at that stage. And I watched these two guys just demolish all these people on the mat. And I just went, wow, this is unbelievable. Um, I myself, how I really fell in love with jiu-jitsu was at the end of that seminar, we wrestled and I was wrestling a girl, maybe 58 kilos, 60 kilos at best, judo black belt, who was holding me down in side control and I couldn't get out. Now I bench pressed her. I was pretty fit at that stage. Finally, I threw her off me and oh, I'm out and she, she, um, rear naked choked me. And so that was my exposure to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where a little 60-kilo girl just rear naked choked me. And and I, I, I believe I could have went either one of two ways with that. I could have went, oh, yeah, if we were fighting, I could have punched her in the head and done this and done that. But I chose the second way, which I went, if she can do that to me, and I was 90 kilos at the time, man, I want to do that to someone else. And so I fell in love with it straight away. How do you view, um, cause you, you, you come from an era where there were traditional martial arts. To me, I still find it very weird now with, with the proof of what the UFC is that I find it really hard to sit around and talk about martial arts and their divided areas of striking and grappling. I think that you really just need to know martial arts these days. Do you, do you feel the same way? Cause it just seems like even with BJJ, it's like people do BJJ and the people that do BJJ don't learn how to strike a lot. Do, what's sort of your opinion now that we've proven that that you need to be at least well-rounded? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I still teach Hapkido uh, and I teach Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, but I, I teach all my kids uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at the end of their Hapkido class, just a little bit, just keeping the mount, taking the back, keeping side control, controlling their person, their partner. And I teach my Hapkido students basically some ground skills, um, but more of it, more as a self-defense type aspect. So I believe it's, it's super important. And, and back in the day, as you asked about the earlier, you know, the earlier styles, you know, what, what, how they embraced it, they used to say to me, uh, you know, um, instructors from other gyms would say to me, well, how are you going to fight someone on the ground if there's multiple opponents? And I'd, I'd scratch my head and I'd say, well, I've got some ground fighting skills. You don't have any. How are you going to hand multiple opponents on the ground? Uh, which, which made a lot of sense to me. Like, you know, hang on, you're asking me this question. What are you going to do? I've got some skill. I've got some idea. And they, they would, they would go, oh, oh, well, it wouldn't get that far. Well, you know, who's to say how it gets to the ground? You know, you, you're in a pub, it's close quarters. You wrestle the guy, he tosses you over, you trip backwards, you, you know, you just fall over somehow and the next thing he's on top of you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I've always said that the best form of self-defense, unless you own a gun, is to learn how to sprint. You just run yourself <laughs> out of there. <laughs> well, well, here you go. Here's, here's, a, here's a good one for you. I watch a lot of um, self-defense and, and uh, instructors teaching this business and, and they always say, hit the guy and run. Hit the guy and then run away. And I say, well, could you imagine hitting a UFC fighter? Say, say, say I lined up and punched Robert Whittaker in the head and then decided I would run away. Oh, for one, two. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So, so one, one, I don't think my punch in the head would affect him. And two, he's probably a faster runner than me. So what the hell am I going to do? You know, so I, I, you know, when I teach a self defense class, I say, look, we're going to have to take the person out regardless of what, and we're going to do whatever we need to to defend ourselves. And in, until they're incapacitated, I'm not going to run away. I'm, going to, I'm not going to turn my back and run away. Uh, and that's how most, you know, if you watch, um, if you look at knife knife attacks, most people have started stabbing 
you know, in the chest and then well, end before up you've even got control, you're, you're arm dragging a knife right into your belly. So. Well, that's right. And then, and then you go, I'm getting out of here. And next thing there's 10 stab marks in your back. Yeah. So, you know, like just running away is, is, is not a good defense. I don't think because, you know, they teach that to women and, and, and to, you know, older guys, how are they going to outrun an assailant sometimes? So you have to do whatever you can to defend yourself and then make sure that person's not getting back up to chase you. So when we get into the, you end up doing the seminar with, with Carlson Gracie. <clears throat> Carlos Gracie. Carlos Gracie, Gracie yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, where where does it go from there? What options are available to you to grapple? And, and when does sort of uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu begin to develop, you know, a, a base out in Australia? Okay, so John Will was all, already um, doing seminars around the country. Well, actually, I don't know if he was doing seminars around the country at that stage. But uh, I, after that, I started looking around for jiu-jitsu seminars. And I was very fortunate to come across um, Jean-Jacques Machado coming to Australia. And so I then uh, went along and participated in that in that seminar. And in that seminar was Jean-Jacques Machado with John Will and Richard Norton. And as the seminar was progressing, John would come over and help me and my, my – um, my business partner, Michael, through some techniques. And I said to Michael, I said, wow, this guy is really good. Uh, John is a, John is an amazing coach and, and instructor. And um, and I said, this guy is really good. We should look at trying to find this guy more often. And so I started looking around for seminars where John was doing seminars and started following him on the seminar circuit. And that's when I was sort of introduced to Anthony Lange and John Simon, who were driving him to seminars. And so I started following John that way, just doing seminars every couple of months, six months, a year. And that was a, that was my progression in jiu-jitsu. It was extremely slow. And just for clarification then, is, is this, are we talking about the lineage? So, so it's Machado, jiu-jitsu under Jean-Jacques. John Will is a student of him and Anthony Lange is a student of John Will. Is, is there already sort of a lineage forming there? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, John was, John, John Will, as you said, he was one of the dirty dozen and he went over and, and was training and was introduced to Brazilian jiu-jitsu and, and he, um, he, he, he got introduced to uh, the Machado brothers where he was training basically out of their garage with the five of them and, and, um, you know, became friends and became their student. And then they brought out, uh, Jean Jacques and, and of course, Anthony was under John Will in Shuto. And so that's where the, the lineage started for the Machados in Australia. So John Will was, uh, uh, he was one of the guys that exposed Jiu Jitsu in Australia. And know. so, uh, because John Will is, as far as I know, I think he's based in Geelong or something. Is this, so is, is Lange, because Lange's in Manly in Sydney. So yep. is he flying out there or how are, how are they, you mentioned they're traveling together, but because this is such the early days, there's, there's not a lot of places to drop in and do this. So how are, how are people training with each other? Um, well, see, John used to travel over to the U.S. to train with the Machado. So okay. every, everyone cries about paying a hundred bucks for a seminar these days with a <laughs> world champion. John was literally flying to America to train with these guys. Um, and then he would come back and then uh, come up and do seminars around Sydney. So Anthony Lange and John Solomon would pick him up from the airport drive him to these gyms where he could do seminars and they would participate in the seminars, of course, and to, for learning. And uh, that's how it basically got started. And at one stage, um, I started take, I took over from Anthony and started picking John up from airports and driving him to different seminars over the weekend. And that was the, that was the way, that was the only way you could sort of learn anything at that stage. There was yeah, no right. YouTube. There were, yeah, there were barely, there were barely any books. So it was by waiting for a seminar to pop up. Well, this reminds me of how important. Um, so, I mean, even in the, the late 90s, it's like the internet was there, but there were predominantly angel fire pages. And I remember the, like, just how much money people would spend on, on VHS sets of, you know, like GoCore and all that stuff, you know, yep. six, six video sets on chokes and, uh, yep. and, and Judo Gene LaBelle and all that sort of stuff. And, um, 
uh, I remember reading an interview years ago. That's how Evan Tanner got into the UFC. He took took his wrestling background and learned how to triangle and all that sort of stuff directly out of out of videos before he joined Team Quest or something. And apparently he he took on like his first four fights with no formal experience except for what he had learned from these VHS instructionals. It was very very interesting. That's in, that's incredible. I mean, that's how I was exposed to UFC. I was in the martial arts shop, and he said, one of the, the, the guy that owned the martial arts shop, which was in Parramatta at that stage, said, have a look at this, and it was a, a, the Ultimate Fighting Championship number one, and it was so badly bootlegged that you could barely make out their faces or <laughs> the figures. You know, it was just you know, really bad, but we loved it. So, um, so, so obviously you, you're you're a product of the uh, of, of Machado BJJ. Um, a lot of people get confused, and also there there's it, it's not really there as much anymore. But the perceived and the and the rivalry, specifically domestically, I remember when I came to Australia, there was this huge rivalry between the Machados and the Gracies because it seemed like for the most part all the Gracies were actual Brazilians who had moved out here and opened up schools, and a lot of the Machado guys, as you mentioned, were were Australians who had learned BJJ here. Uh, and this seemed to be you know, pretty prevalent when I first moved over here in 2004. What, what do you remember um, about Gracie's coming in and sort of the, uh, the rivalry between the two groups? Uh, I, I, I don't know um, because we, we, sort of, we sort of knew the story between Machado and Gracie's. There was no rivalry when they were in Brazil and, and that. But um, I think over here – when the Brazilians started coming in, I, I don't think it was—I don't think it was a, a big rivalry in that regard. But what I think what they started was the the bit of the old style where you can't cross train. You know, um, if you don't train under them, you can't just go into the school and train. You have to be a member and things like that. And and then of course, it, when when the competition started, it was basically. All of us as a group who know, who know each other against those guys as a group who know each other. So, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say it was that dramatic. Although I do remember um, Parosh and and that competing against some of the Gracie guys and feeling bummed if they got beat and happy if they got if they if they beat the Gracies. But yeah, I think it was just mostly that. It was their group and our group. Like, you know, if, if you're at a party and there's a bunch of people over there that you don't know and you're hanging with a bunch of people you do know. So that's what I think. What was your first um, introduction to, to Elvis and Anthony? As I mentioned, when I moved over here, I ended up at their gym in, in Concord. So um, where do you remember them sort of popping up in the scene? Um, well, I was uh, I was driving over to Manly to train with Anthony Lange, um and um, – I'm not sure. This would have been, I guess, about 1998, I think. I'm not sure what year. But I, I was heading over to Manly to train with Anthony in the mornings. And I knew of Elvis Sinisic. I, I, I'd seen him at, uh, at, at, you know, in the UFC. I think it was, I think it was at that stage he would have been in the UFC. The timeline's a bit of a blur. Anyway, so I knew of Elvis. He had tapped out Jeremy Horn with the triangle. And so I'm training with Anthony Lange and Elvis Sinisic walks in and uh, I was like, oh, wow, this guy fought in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And uh, he pops on Anthony Lange's gi. Now, you know Elvis and I know Elvis. He's about six foot four. <laughs> yeah. Anthony Lange is like about five eight or something. Five yeah, nine. five eight. <laughs> uh, and a lot lighter than Elvis. So he pops on Elvis's, Anthony's gi. And he says, who would want to wrestle? And so I looked around and everyone walked off the floor. And I went, I put my hand up and went, I'll freaking wrestle. Shit, Jesus, here's a chance to wrestle someone who fought in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. And um, I I was just, I was just thought it was unbelievable. It was so good. It was so much fun. You know, he just, he obliterated me. And, um, but I had no grips, of course, because he was wearing Langley's D. But <laughs> up to his elbows or something was wearing the yeah. Yeah. But but it was it was just I thought this is a great opportunity. This is what that's what I looked at it as. And if he tapped me out, I just went fantastic. Let's go again. Cool. Um, what becomes your experience in between those years? Because um, you know I'm doing a little bit of background. You know, the people that are going to listen to this want to know more about. Uh, your your career as a referee. So you're a, you're a gym owner who then is, is there at sort of the onset of the UFC. 
What's happening between these years before you decide that, uh, well, I guess probably even before that, what makes you decide that you're interested in refereeing? Um, well, it was after Brazil. Well, actually, it wasn't. Um, I was doing Hapkido for for many years, and under one of the one of the um, one of the organisations I was under was having a, a tournament, and it was in Minto where I lived. And uh, so I went, oh yeah, okay. And he said, can you referee this? I said, well, well okay, fair enough. Let's see how we go. And it was this a stand up. There was no grappling or anything. And so basically they're offering trophies with the thousand dollar reward at the end of the night. So basically when you won your division, then you would fight off as like an absolute division and you would fight off to whoever won got a thousand bucks. And, um, so I went along and, and refereed the fights and I refereed the Carter because there was Carter back then too. And, uh, I remember watching some of these guys fighting and I thought, this is great. And, uh, a, a brown belt, a little known brown belt by the, by the name of Peter Graham was in the competition. And so I was lucky enough to ref the main event between him and a, another smaller kickboxer. And it was uh, such a good match. And Peter Graham had it all over this, this smaller guy, much smaller guy. But I remember Peter Graham and, and what a gentleman he was mm, and, he's and a how great he guy. did. He is a great guy. And he just, he just did, did enough to not hurt this guy, but win the match. And it was, I thought, I, I went to him straight afterwards and I said, mate, you're a gentleman. And he thanked me. He was a brown belt in, um, Kyokushin at that stage. And, and I remember that. That was my first exposure to refereeing in a tournament. After that, it was many years later, I, um, I come across Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and when we were having our inter club tournaments at Langy's gym, I said, oh, I wouldn't mind trying this refereeing. So I, I sort of learnt the, the rules then and, and started to referee Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And it wasn't until years later that I actually stepped into refereeing MMA. MMA. I had um uh, I I I lived in Concord for a number of years and I ended up moving into the city for a few years and I switched gyms and was at boxing work so I got to train with with Larry and Larry. Peter was there all the time as well and they were both fantastic cuz cuz Larry's very wrestling oriented so I learned a lot about Greco-Roman wrestling from him and then as you said Peter would work on a lot of um cuz he he had transitioned he was doing pro boxing at the same time as well so he was winning titles in both while doing MMA um and as you said, he would always take the time to spar with you, but he would never, even though he clearly had the ability to, because he's got to walk around at what, about 110, 115 yep. kilos yeah. solid, but he would only go at a level where he, he'd he sort of make you realize your openings as you were doing them without f- forcing you to, to to pay for them. And it's uh, out of all the people that I've sparred with, he was the, you know, the, n- not just the most technical but the way that would that would allow you to spar with sort of identifying your holes while you were sparring it was it was fascinating yep. oh he he's as i said he's just such a gentleman and he'll spend time with everyone talking about anything he's just that sort of guy mm definitely um Okay, so uh, we start getting into refereeing. I guess probably that's a good thing as well because you would have been around from you know where IBJJF starts picking up steam. Uh, what are what are some of the changes that you've noticed? I mean, the big thing really seems to be um, issues around leg locks and, and reaping and this sort of stuff. How how has um, uh, how has the rules changed around IBJJF before we get into your oh, UFC it's stuff? dramatic, dramatically. I I I refereed last weekend at John Wills comp the gathering in Melbourne, and um and just the, I read the rules before I went onto the mat, and it was just there's just so many rules in jiu jitsu now, whereas back in the day it was basically scoring points, and the hardest thing was to score an advantage, and um. You know, the advantage was basically if I had to defend a choke, then you got the advantage, you know. Um, but, you know, it was a slow progressive thing then. I started refing on, um, you know, the, the Brazilian tournaments. And, uh, so I was, I was sort of doing a fair bit of jujitsu refereeing then. And then every time we'd, we'd have to step on the mat to referee, they'd come and say, this rule has changed or that rule has changed. And, and it was just getting mind boggling. And when you're out of it for a little bit, suddenly there's so many rule changes. It's so different now. And with, like you said, the, the leg reaping rule, 
that was so difficult uh, because, you know, it was just a natural thing to sort of stop the person by putting your leg, you know, across their body, you know, uh, regardless of where you were. Um, and, you know, you saw a lot of people bunging on things, you know, like um, milking, milking it. Um, and it was just it, it, trying it, to eke out a DQ good. in and those sorts of things. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And so now, you know, it's it's a lot more complicated as far as I'm concerned, um, and maybe too complicated somewhat. And so that's why I think these new uh, uh, submission only competitions uh, are really refreshing to watch. Cool. Um, so then, what, so you're doing BJJ comps, and then um, how, how do you get approached, or how do you move into that? Uh, yeah, ultimately, a different sport, which is MMA. Um, well, I was I, I was um, traveling along pretty well, and there, we heard that there was a, a fight promotion who wanted to do MMA. It was No Holds Barred, or I think at that stage in um, in Penrith Panthers, which is you know not far from me. And um, the promoter uh, put it on and they just called – they were fighters short, so they call up, who wants to fight? So someone from the crowd would jump up and run in there and they'd have a fight. And um, so then I, I, I was training jiu-jitsu and I had a guy who wanted to fight and so I started looking around for a promotion to put him on. And I think after two two promotions of, of – um, this guy's promotions, I said, oh, I suppose we could go on, on that promotion. And he was really the first guy who really started MMA in New South Wales, New, you know, MMA, promoting, promoting MMA in New South Wales. Um, I have to yeah. segue here and ask you a question because you mentioned um, MMA events going on at, at Panthers. And I remember heading out there a few times to go watch the uh, – I don't even know if they were connected, but it was like the Australian version of King of the Cage out there, which they used yep. to host a lot. Yep. What I have to ask this. What do you remember about Tony Bonello? Because oh, Tony. <laughs> I – for years I heard rumors that, that he came from a, a fairly affluent background and that he would – pay to have fights thrown and a number of other things before that sort of infamous footage in strike force where he fights um uh ninja ninja who uh, that's yeah. right yeah. yeah um i i i can't say i know tony um but i knew of him and and what i knew of him he was taunting elvis like unbelievably every every I, I show think I that yeah yeah, he would wear a T-shirt saying Elvis is a chicken or something like that. He was chasing Elvis to fight him. He was just taunting him badly. And um, I asked Elvis, I said, so why don't you go and fight this guy? And he said, well, think of it this way. He said, I'm internationally ranked. He said, why would I go fight this guy and put that that in jeopardy? And I, I went, yeah, okay, that's a smart way of looking at it. But Tony was, um, he was, I think he was friends with the promoter who was running those shows, which was the – the guy who really started MMA in New South Wales. And, um, and so, you know, Tony, um, as I said, I don't know him, but Tony was, you know, chasing fights all the time and trying to get, you know, trying to get his name in the limelight. Do you remember what happened to him? I, I, I um, I've been talking with John Wayne Parr and we're probably going to look to do um, a similar interview with him. And I remember him fighting Benello like in yep. an MMA match and that I think the whole thing went for about a minute and a half effectively Tony yeah. took him down and, and it was over but then he just seemed to um, uh, he really seemed to just vanish from the scene before sort of popping up randomly in, in Strike Force. and uh, as far as I know no one really ever heard from him again no I, I don't know what's happened to him the last time I saw him he was doing that um, bully beatdown I think it was that's right yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> so right. That, right. I, I don't know what happened to him after that apparently he nearly got beaten on bully beatdown <laughs> There's a video of it out there. I, I'll have to go back and watch it. But, man, MTV has certainly changed from Aaron Motley crew videos, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. But it's funny thing you should mention, uh, John Wayne Parr. I remember John Wayne Parr. We were at Panthers, and John Wayne Parr was there, and, and I was talking to him, and he said, oh, I'm going to take a fight in eight weeks. I'm going to fight Tony Bonello. And I went, you're kidding. And he went, no. And he said, why? And I said, hey, do you know anything about the ground fighting? And he said, no. Nah. And I was basically giving him a jiu-jitsu lesson in right. Panthers <laughs> that night. And then he said he was going over to the U.S. or going somewhere to train. 
And after that, you know, that was history too because Tony just took him down, which he would. I, yeah. I wouldn't try and mix it up with John Wayne Parr, that's for sure. sure. But even the body types are different. Like, like I remember when they fought Benella's, you, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like the traps, the more sort of rotund body that a grappler has versus the, the more stick figure style of a, of a, of a Muay Thai guy. You know, it's, it was very obvious just looking at them of what was going to happen. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And we knew, we'd seen, we knew, we'd, we'd watched and followed UFC all those years, so we knew exactly mm. what was going to happen to him. I was so excited when I arrived there, because in the foyer of Panthers, um, uh, Mark Hunt was standing around, and, you know, I'm, I'm in, in my early 20s or something, I absolutely lost it. I just ran up to him, and he was quite quite taken away, taken aback that someone had recognized him, because I don't even... um I think he had just started with Pride, so it's not like you know a lot of people wouldn't have known. And I was, I was really, I ended up seeing him gradually a few times after that on the on the local Sydney grappling circuit as, as he was trying to figure out how to grapple. And I think he was doing a lot of work with with Steve Oliver. But I was really surprised because he was literally about th- the width of me three times over, but at about yeah. the height of about five eight or something. So I was, <laughs> I had a full head and shoulders over him, but he was. He was like three door frames wide. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, one of the stories I remember, I was refing a, a show, which was a very – it was a failed show in Sydney uh, that came out – an American promoter came out. And um, I remember Peter Graham fighting Jim York. I, I was there. Was. So they did two shows. Yeah. I'm trying to remember who that was because um, Dennis Kang was out here. Bustamante yeah. fought on that. And I think Sydney, right. yeah. Sydney got the show between Shamrock and Hizzo. And then Brisbane yeah. did a show the night before with like Jeff or uh, sorry, Josh Barnett headlining. And I remember a whole bunch of the fighters said they didn't get paid for either one of those events. That's right. Yeah, that's right. They didn't either. Um, but I remember, I remember distinctly Peter Graham saying to Jim York, he said, you're not as fast as Mark Hunt, but you hit just as hard. And, yeah. and I find it hard to believe because Mark just when when you're in a cage with Mark and he hits someone, you just go, "Holy crap!" That is something else. <laughs> well, it must be uh, Peter must be very complimentary then, because I remember um, you know when you talk about training at uh, when I was talking about training at Boxing Works, I was there when UFC 110 came to town, and that was huge because all the fighters were staying at I don't know, I don't know if they were at the Hilton or whatever, but Boxing Works was the nearest gym to them. So we had Vondelay come through, Noguera come through, Rafael Cordero was there with the guys. I think Ed Soares might have been there as well. Christoph Szczynski was training there. I don't know why, but Mayhem Miller was in town as well with these guys. <laughs> um, so, and um, afterwards, Peter told me because he was sparring with uh, with Vondelay, and he he told me that he had never been hit by someone so hard as Vondelay. And yep. so when you you know, if you're talking about Mark Hunt and Jim York, that almost seems hard to believe because Vondelay would have been what ninety yep. five kilos oh, when he was heavy compared yep. to, you know, Mark Hunt is probably what cutting to make two sixty five in, in yep. the heavyweight division. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, um, I don't know. It's a <clears throat> different time. So, um, so how do you get into the course? I, th- I think we're, we, we're sort of skirting okay, again. So, we're talking about memories yes. as opposed to. Yes. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, well, I started having, I was looking around to put my fighter on a show and, um, this, this promoter was having a show at the Whitlam Center and it fell through. And so Lucy Tui took over the show and, um, uh, her and Mark Hunt put on this show where it was in the ring. And I, I said to one of the girls who was running around helping the other promoter, who was John Pedro, actually. Okay. Um, I said, how do you get into refereeing? And she said, oh, they're looking for referees. Do you want a referee? And I said, yeah, well, you know, why not? And so on this show where I put a fighter in, they also asked me to referee, and I ended up refereeing most of the fights and the main event <laughs> with, okay. um, with Hector Lombard and, uh, oh, here we go. Terrible. I'm terrible with names. Ooh, but I refereed the main event. So I, 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 I cornered my fighter and then I was refing fights and, and, and did the main event and fell in love with it then and there. Let me, um, let me internet this and see what Sherdog says. Cause uh, as I said, so I, I did CFC a couple of times, but I assume this was pre this before, before the- yeah, this was pre- before you were at CFC. <laughs> Uh, so um, really he's that. on There's... the tip of my tongue, the fighter's name, and he's such a nice guy. Fabrice, you know, oh, Fabio Galeb. 
Oh, I've got to go back here. Okay, so that's Oceania Fighting Championships. Oh, that's right, yeah. Right, okay. Interesting. It was uh, F- Fabio Gala versus Hector Lombard. So this means... Um, I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd already ref Hector in a jiu-jitsu match prior to that, I think. Might have been prior to that or might have been just after that. And Hector was just a beast. And, what do you um, remember about so, him? Because I remember he'd come into the gym and there was no off button. Every every drill and every sparring session was a fight with that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's, that's Hector. You know, he's a bit of a – you know, he – I, I got a lot of respect from Hector. He always showed me respect and he was very humble around me. And I ref Hector probably more times than anyone. And I, I thought he was an unbelievable fighter. He was just a wrecking machine. And, uh, but I, I was fortunate enough not to ever wrestle against him mm. <laughs> because, of course, Elvis's brother did and ended up injured out of it. Yeah. I remember that but, story. He broke his ankle, I think, wrestling with him or something yeah, just in the period yeah. of the takedown. Yeah. So. Um, but I mean, I did, I did ask Hector for a wrestle one night at my gym, but, um, thank God he declined. <laughs> declined. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So you, you get into refereeing. I mean, there's, um, I assume there's not even a system in place if you've just been asked to referee a match. So, uh, I was looking at a photo online. So refer the MMA referees courses are, are these end up being designed by big John McCarthy or because there's a photo of you being becoming accredited by him. So what becomes this story of how you you're able to springboard out of the local scene? Um, well, I, I, I started refereeing on, you know, a couple of little shows and I, I just suddenly thought, I don't know enough about this stuff. I really don't. I, you know, I think I know enough because I'm a BJJ. I think I was brown belt at the time and a hapkido black belt and I'd done striking and that. And I thought, I know, I know enough about this to referee. Yeah, bump out. No, I don't. Uh, and I, fi- I figured that out and I thought, well, who do I go to? So of course I tried to contact a bunch of people in New South Wales, including the government. No one could point me to anyone who had any knowledge about coaching or training MMA uh, referees. So I thought, well, you know what? I might as well get in touch with Big John. And so when I got in touch with Big John, he talked about having a course. He hadn't had any at that stage. And so I kept on him. When are you going to have the course? When are you going to have the course? When are you going to have the course? And he finally gave me a date back in 2007. Excuse me, I'm just going to cough. <laughs> Anyway, so I said, okay, sign me up. I'm coming. And so I flew over to LA and participated in John McCarthy's first ever referee training course. And uh, I said to him the first day I walked in, I said, uh, you know, I said, listen, I'm here to learn and to be accredited by you, but please, please do not pass me just because I come from Australia. I, because if I don't pass, I'll come back. Because there was a fail rate, you know. And he said, he said, well, okay, yeah, trust me, don't worry, that'll happen. <laughs> and and um, and it was only a two day, pretty much a two day course, but it went all day, right until I think he he had to stop talking at midnight. So it was unbelievable just listening to his stories. And even then I realized I, there was more I didn't know. And, and in fact, all the people in the, in that course, very few of them knew, knew very much at all, to be honest. Uh, and some of them have been refereeing in the US, you know, much more than what, what I had. And so, uh, at the end of the course, there was a few, a few uh, differences in names that we called like jujitsu techniques. And he said, yeah, but I understand that. That's not a problem. And so I was one of um, five only that passed that course. What five, do you, out, five out of 20 there was. Do, do you have any uh, anything you can share about that sort of crop of, of referees? So you've got John McCarthy, other guys I can think of are like Mario Yamasaki, Yves Levine, who I haven't seen much of lately, Mazagati. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I mean, back in those days, Big John was the, the name. He was the referee. He was the one everybody wanted to learn from. He was he had the most input into MMA officiating for sure, without well, a doubt. Reasonably so. Yeah, and um, and there were other referees running around like the Yamasaki and and Eve Levine and that, but um, Big John was the man. So that's why I went and did the course with him. But um, 
you know, now I know Herb Dean, of course, and uh, I've, I've refereed with Herb and Mark Goddard and Leon Roberts and, uh, you know, a bunch of other referees. I've never met – I haven't met Dan Mergliardi yet. Um, I haven't met Eve Levine. I haven't met Mazzagardi, and I haven't met Yamasaki. So I can't tell you anything much about those guys. Okay. Um, take us through actually refereeing. It's – it. It's a very thankless job, and there is some online criticism about different fights that you've done. So uh, just talk about your mindset in there, and, and what are some of the you know, external factors that, that you're trying to block out while you're involved uh, you know, in, in the heat of a, a match? So just just my personality is that when I do something, I have to try and do it the best I can. So in all sports, every sport I've done, every everything I do, I have to try and be the best I can be at it. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so, you know, I, I don't take anything lightly. So going to America and coming back from America, I thought, how, how the hell am I going to remember all this stuff? But sure enough, as I refereed, it was coming back to me. And I was very fortunate that Luke Pizzuti, the promoter of CFC, said, Steve, you run it. You run the officials. So I was really fortunate that that happened. I took on, I took on that role very seriously. So, you know, I would do a full rules meeting with all the fighters. Um, I'm very engaged with the fighters so that I, so they understand the rules. Because the last thing I want to do is ever have to deduct a point, disqualify a fo- or disqualify a fighter. You know, I don't want that. So when I approach any any fight, I, I don't usually um, – like I know a lot of fighters. So if you see me at the fight show, say you're going to be a fighter, I'll always say hello and goodbye and that's it pretty much until after the fight because I also want to be perceived as being very fair, which I am, impartial, absolutely. And so I'm very serious about my role as a referee. So when I go into a match, um, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious of what's going on. And you have to look in so many different areas while you're refereeing. I block out the crowd. I don't care what the crowd say or do. I block out usually. I can hear what they say and I can hear what the, the coaches and the cornermen say, but I block it out because I know the rules. I know, I know the rules. I know what's going on in the fight. Um, and I, I have a complete understanding of it. So I block out everything that everyone says. And, or, or you know, when the crowd's yelling, stand them up, stand them up, ref, I just ignore that. It doesn't matter to me. I, it's about the fighters. It's completely about the fighters for me. There is there is discussion around that. You know, during a live fight, what's your opinion of standing up and stalling fighters? There's, uh, you know, guys like Rogan are adamant that if the fight's on the ground, that's where it has to stay. Do you... Do you believe that it should ever be brought up? At what point does the fight need to be brought back up? Okay, so here's how to look at it. And, and this is, this, is, whenever I explain anything, people suddenly go, yeah, okay, wow, there's a method to this. Um, I, I look at the fight and, and how that fighter got to that position. So if you, uh, if a fighter is working actively to get a takedown and he's pressing the other guy against the fence and he's working very hard to get a takedown, the other guy's defending against it and then he finally gets a takedown, then I'm going to give this guy some time to work. You know, it, it, he's earned that position and it's not my job to let the other fighter out of a position. You know, and I, I've had plenty of criticism over the years. You know, when fighters are stalling and they've got to, you know, if they're in a dominant position, I'm going to leave them there. It's not my job to let you out, mate, from underneath. If that guy has t- managed to take you down, get control of you, it's not my job to let you out. You, you, you work out of it. You're the fighter, not me. And so I'm, you know, I understand when a fighter's stalled and I need to warn the fighters and then I'll give them a bit of time before I stand them up. And so, I, you know, I understand the fight game. And, and that's what I tell the fighters in the, in, so you, what a lot of people don't realize is I give a, a fight brief to every fighter I referee in the UFC or, or even the local fights where I give them my instructions. And if they hear me say work, then that means either you work or you don't, depends on your strategy. 
I'm going to give you some more time. If nothing happens, I'm going to stop you and stand you up. So I, I do give them time. Um, if they're stalling, I can def- I can certainly see when they're stalling. Mm, okay. So, well, what about with things that become a little bit gray? So, like, like as an example, I don't have any issues with the twelve to six elbow, but as soon as we start launching that from either ten, eleven, or one or two o'clock. It becomes an overhand, or in particular, the the big one that seems to happen a lot of the time is when shooting for like a single leg takedown or against the cage, or hammer fists that are intended for the side of the head that start getting into the back of the head region. How do you try to measure that? Because I certainly don't think someone who's in the heat of the moment is intending to break the rules. I think you just you go into that sort of fight or flight mode, and and it, adjusting that uh, you. How, how you handle that on the fly. Okay, so, you know, every every fighter that's uh, training now who's training for a, a fight under the unified rules has to understand the rules and has to know that if they hit the back of the head, they can be penalised for it. So once again, in my, in my fighter brief, I talk to the fighters and I say, if you hear me say, watch the back of the head, you need to pick your shots. <laughs> don't just keep going about hitting the person in the back of the head because I will stop the fight. You will lose position. You could lose a point and you can be disqualified. So I'm very, I'm very clear and concise in the rules. Uh, and um, basically the description is if you're catching the ear, then I'm going to let the fight, I'm going to let it go. As soon as it goes past that ear and to the back of the head, then it's going to be classed as the back of the head, and I'm going to warn you. And if you hear my warning, you need to heed that warning and pick your shots. Otherwise, you could lose a, lose a point. Um, now, a lot of people don't understand the back of the head rule either. And, and um, you know, so can, you, can I ask you, what's your understanding of the back of the head rule? Do you know it? I would sort of, for me, again, without clarification, I would describe that area as behind the ears so if i'm looking at the back of the head behind behind anywhere the ears probably up to where that sort of ring area is at the top of your head where your head goes all the way up to probably the top of the shoulders i describe that that large area broadly as the back of the head okay so basically if you look at the crown the crown of a fighter and a mohawk coming down behind the head to the top of the ears, and then from the top of the ears to anywhere behind the ears is the back of the head. So, you know, you get fighters complaining, he's hitting me in the back of the head when it's he's above your side. the... Yeah, it's above the ears, and it's uh, 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 partially on the back of the head, but it's on the side more. The temple, effectively, is the landing there. Yeah, but yeah. but even even closer to the back, because you think it's a mohawk coming down from the from the crown, and then at the top of the years, at the top of the years, that's when it becomes. So the you know, specifications are actually a lot more narrow than most of us would think. Yeah, it used to be. You know, a lot of people used to say it's like a headphone rule if you're wearing headphones. So well, that's not the truth. And then the way I originally taught it was like a mohawk all the way down the spine, um, and that's not the rule either. So it's very, it's very clear and specific. And so that's how I I ref the fight on the weekend where the fighter was trying to shoot in. And the other guy was elbowing his head, and I was waiting for someone to say that's the back of the head, which it wasn't, because it was, you know, below the crown, but it was on the side more, and um, and it was they were good shots. And just going on the twelve to six elbow, it's only twelve to six. If it's if it has a, an arc on it, any sort of arc. So if it came from eleven to five, then that's okay. Can you with with the twelve to six elbow? Does that, it doesn't matter which way it comes, because in theory, well, you can't really, if we're talking about the overhand elbow, almost the way like a cricketer's bowl that comes over, yep. both that and the elbow up and straight down, those are considered the same 12 to 6, effectively? No, 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 no. no. It's only when you, so if you, it, it's hard to explain, I demonstrate it. It's like I reach up for the ceiling and then bring my elbow down to the floor. And, we, and, and we'll say heaven to earth, because then if you're on your back, and it's parallel to the floor, it's not a 12 to 6 elbow. It's only from the clock. If you look at a clock facing, there's the 12 and the 6. It's that downward motion. Okay. That's it. That's so it. Put an arc on it, and it's okay. That's okay. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, 
So you you end up in the UFC uh, just just recently. I saw in your Facebook post you had posted your experiences with um you know when it was under Ziffa ownership of Dana and the and the Fertitas. Oh yeah. Do you want to just talk briefly about you know your relationship with uh, with them? Okay, uh, I don't really have a relationship with them, but or your but, encounters, uh, but, I guess, is probably yeah yeah more yeah. Okay, so term. um I, I originally got called up for UFC 110. So so just I was the first ever Australian UFC referee. So. That's that's my claim to fame. I was the first ever Australian UFC referee, and and that came about with UFC 110 when they came to Sydney, and um, so I met Dana on that show. I asked if I could go in and, and just meet him, and I met him, and I just said, "Look, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to work on the UFC," and he said, "Yep, good luck, and thanks very much, and see you later." And that was it, pretty much. And over a period of time, you know. We've never had really long conversations, but we've 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 spoken very briefly, very briefly about different things. Um, and he, he's not really a fan of referees, mostly because <laughs> I've heard some of the comments. <laughs> yeah, because you know, there's always you can't please everybody all of the time, and you know, he always um, he criticizes the referees sometimes too much. But that's that's our job, you know. We're in there, we get criticized, and I'm I'm okay with that. That's fine. Um, and so, you know, we don't have, you know, he won't talk to us. He won't, he, he'll go by and say, get out and shake our hands sometimes and just, you know, like at, in, in Shenzhen, he went past and we looked at each other and we went like, wow, when Andrade lost, you know, and we both just looked at each other and went, what the hell? Um, I thought she was going to lose. I have to say that. I just thought, I don't, I don't know. I, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't blown away by the result by any means. Oh wow! Uh, really, I was. I, I I couldn't see it. I could, yeah, but that's why I'm a referee, not a fighter. I guess. <laughs> oh, I've been wrong on many, many other fighters. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, but then, you know, I was. Uh, I think it was the Philippines. It might have been Korea. I was walking just through the corridor, and Frank Fatita just said, "Hey, Steve." And I stopped and I went, "Oh, hi. How are you going?" And shook his hand. He said, "Good, good." He said. Uh, he said, how are you today? And I said, I'm really good, thanks. How are you? And he said, I'm good. And he said, when was the last time I saw you? And I said, oh, probably Japan. You know, I'd just come from USC Japan not long before that. He said, that's right. Yeah, it was Japan. He said, look, I, I hope you have a really good day today. And um, thanks, you know, for everything you do. And and uh, we just parted ways. And it was just like a really um, – it was just a, it was like a compliment that he actually knew who I was. Just a recognition and, of. Yeah, being absolutely. There, yeah. Okay. And, and it just really felt good. It really felt nice, you know. It just felt, it was just like someone gave me a pat on the back and he was so genuine and so nice. It was really surprising, you know. He's a multi-millionaire just stopping a guy who's just refereeing, just walking down the corridor and just decided to speak to me. So it was really nice. You, uh, you, uh, you get the regular, the opportunity to travel regularly now across yes. Asia. Is it, um, you know, for people that, that work, when they go on a business trip, oftentimes they go to the airport, to the hotel, to their meeting, and then they're out of there. Do you actually have some time before and after on each side to uh, be a holiday maker? Um, I, well, I could. So with the UFC, they're very good like that. The UFC will say, um, when do you want to fly in? And I might say, look, if I want to fly in five days early, they'll fly me in five days early, but but then I have to pay for my accommodation until it's time for me to go to work. And that's really good. And most organizations are good like that because they're going to pay, pay the flights anyway. So most organizations are really good like that. Um, with a, a lot of the shows, like I travel, to, I travel to China every month, basically, and referee over there. And I just try and get in and get back home pretty quickly. So it's, they're very short trips. I've been to China a lot, so I, I, you know, I don't need to hang around there for too long. But <laughs> yeah, we, we've got, um, we can go into other countries and hang around. Like when we did UFC Korea, I, I flew over there, I think three days earlier and hung out with, um, my good friend Greg Clanjans and Herb Dean for three days, and um, we just we went to bars and went to went went and listened to some bands and just ate food and had a had a really good time. Cool. Um, Asia is really the uh, actually before we talk about Asia, because you've been around this scene. How how have you seen the UFC grow domestically here in Australia? Um, well, because I was on the on the CFC, and that was. I mean, there was a lot of shows then when the CFC was going around, but CFC was pretty much 
the premier MMA show for Australia, I, I believe. And so a lot of the fighters that went to the first UFC and beyond were from that show, were from CFC. So um, that was a really good – That was a, the CFC was like a stepping stone to the UFC pretty much. But after the UFC came and went, the the local shows struggled a lot. I felt, and I think, I think because a lot of the big names that they had to find on shows suddenly were contracted to the UFC. Um, so it meant that domestically we had to find new fighters. And, uh, you know, shows like CFC suffered and a lot of shows went by the wayside. And it meant there was even smaller local shows now. And still, I don't think we've recovered to where we have one major show, which is a stepping stone to the UFC. We have some good shows, like I was at Hex on the weekend. That's a great show. Yeah, Diamond Hex seems Back. to have filled the spot because Hex has got the – they've got airtime with Fox Sports as well, so they seem to be, do a, a good job of, of filling that void. Well, they're, they're, they're professional. They're mm. professional. Their promoters are very good. And the same with Diamondback fighting championship in Adelaide. The pro- professional – the promoters that want to – promote the fighters <laughs> and give them a great experience at the same time. Do you know what happened to CFC? Why did that? Um, Cause that was, that was Luke Pizzuti's promotion. And, and do, do you know why it fell over or why he stopped doing it? I, I don't fully know, but I feel I, once again, I think it was the fact that the UFC had come to town and, and took a lot of the fighters and it just became, I think it became hard. And then there were a lot of other promotions just popping up left, right and center, which, which means in a small community of fighters like Australia, um, it's it makes it very hard. the product effectively. Ex- exactly right. You hit the nail on the head. Exactly right. And that's, that's pretty much why, why I think it went by the wayside, unfortunately. Now he's back with Superfight, of course. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, well, look, as, as we said, the, 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 the area where MMA is really kicking off now is in Asia. Uh, you know, you talked about the work that you're doing in, in China. They've got a, a Chinese champion in the UFC now. And 1FC is, from from what I can gather without knowing the figures, it looks like 1FC is actually a larger organization than the UFC because of their their footprint and viewership. You've got an interesting story because you you don't referee for 1FC, but but you know the organization quite well. Yes. Yes, I do. Okay, so tell us about that. Okay, so um, in 2010, um, I was I was approached by a promoter named Victor Kui, who's the CEO, for, one of the CEOs for One FC, and he was um, talking about uh, having a, a show in Singapore um, for TV, basically for ESPN. And wanted me to come over and train some officials and referee on the show. So I agree, I agreed to it. And when I got over there, he had set up a training program for some of the, um, the founders or leaders for MMA in different countries from, um, like China. There was one. There was uh, one from India, from Philippines, um, uh, from Thailand, and so I I did basically a two day training course for these guys who then went off and and started educating in those other countries, and some of them stayed and worked for the show. The show the show was uh, called Martial Combat, and I flew out there for six months straight. So not six months straight, sorry, six times each month. So it was um, I went out to Singapore six times and uh, refereed the show, which was over two nights. And that was the catalyst for um, 1FC. And unfortunately, when they changed the rules, because they used to run the unified rules, when they changed the rules to allowing uh, head kicks on the ground of a ground fighter, I I, uh, didn't agree with that. And um, I decided not to work the show. And, you know, the the CEO said to me... um, that they were, they had plans to have, you know, 50 shows in the next three years or something like that. And I said, look, I, I can't, I just can't, um, go against what I believe, which is I believe in the unified rules. I, and I, I don't agree with head kicks on the ground of a ground fighter. And it's mostly because, you know, I always draw a conclusion from the worst case scenario. Anyway, so we parted ways. We're still friends. I still, I still, um, 
talk to him. And he said, if ever you're here, come to a 1FC and I'll go and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to see it. But, um, we disagreed on that situation. And so I, I couldn't do it. Okay. Um, the situation is different within other organizations. There's still quite a, uh, a, a dubious underbelly for a lot of um, organizations that that are running around, and, and it's not uncommon to hear about uh, you know fighter pay fighters that don't get paid for making an appearance. And you um, recently made a little bit of news for backing out of um, is it Battlefield FC, uh, and I think they had a history of doing this before. So you, do you want to just shed some light on that situation and and other sort of stories of both fighters and people that work in the industry protecting themselves? Um, yeah, sure. I, I, I'm a person that um, I, I believe in, in integrity. And so I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys that all that, that, that won't do something because it's not right. And so um, when I was approached by Battlefield and it came via a, a U.S. referee who couldn't do it, he said, I'll put you in contact with them. Um, we had agreed upon a, a, a fee and a deposit and flights and everything like that. And as it got closer to the event, the promoter was becoming increasingly difficult to deal with. And I had already, I knew about his previous record of having a show and not paying the fighters. So everything I had in place was once again very clear. And um, as it approached, it became very difficult to deal with. And so I, I said to the promoter, I said, look, you know, I want to make sure the people I'm bringing to Macau are going to be paid because I was taking a whole team. I was taking, uh, you know, um, three, three judges, another referee, a referee from my tie bout, uh, four inspectors, a timekeeper. So I was taking a whole team and, and I was very concerned that we would not be paid. And I didn't want to be put on the spot at the, at the venue or at the hotel when he said, Oh, look, I can't pay you. I didn't want, I didn't want that conflict. And so I was very, very strict with him. And I said, look, uh, um, you know, we need our flights and we need to make sure we're going to get paid. And he assured me we were going to be paid. Uh, the night before we were supposed to fly out, I was still trying to get flights the night before, and this is not a good thing because I had judges saying to me, I don't want to do the show anymore. This is too dubious. And so I totally understood. And Could said, you just okay, explain well, that? What, what do you, who, you're still trying to get flights out or you're still waiting for them to confirm that they have paid to get you on a flight out there? Well, see, they have to supply us with flights. Yeah. So we had not received flights okay. the day before. The day before we were supposed to fly out, we had not received flights from the promoter. Okay. So that's extremely unusual. And so he, the promoter scrambled to get the flights. And that night we received the flights. And a lot of the judges said to me, we don't want to do it. We're too scared. We're not going to get paid. We're going to go there for no reason. And understandably so. And I said, okay, well, we'll have to just, you know, Fill in, fill in the other officials, however we can. And he was, he was going to bring the the promoter was going to bring some officials from Korea, who was going, who were going to work with us. Anyway, the the next morning, I said to, I made the decision, and said to the promoter, "Look, I'm only going to come <clears throat> and bring my people if I receive full payment." And um, he said, okay, yes, I completely understand, because he'd mucked us around a lot. And he, he actually understood. And, and I said, I want to receive full payment. And he said, yep, okay, it'll be done. Give me half an hour. And this was at 10 o'clock in the morning. At about 1.30, he rang me and said, uh, it'll be in your account in no time at all. I said, well, it better be, because I'm not going to get on the plane if I don't receive it. He said, no problem. I got on the train to go to the airport at five o'clock in the afternoon. No payment. I got to, I got to the airport. Still no payment. Tried to contact him. I couldn't contact him. So I messaged him and said, look, I'm, I'm pulling the pin. I'm not going to do it now. 
Um, and it wasn't for an hour after that. I think he rang me and said, okay, the payment will be in in your account in half an hour. And I said, look, I've pulled the pin. None of the officials are coming. It's unfortunate. I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes, mate. I can't, I can't, I can't expect my officials to fly over there and not be paid. This is interesting as well. So when, when you say like my team, so you're not hired on as a single official. Are you brought on sort of as the leader of a team of officials that, that come over? Is that how that works? Um, Okay, uh, and that show, yes, I was, but um, it's, a, it's a little bit complicated. So since, like, going back to CFC days, I basically trained all the officials, judges, inspectors, and not many people know about the inspectors. And then for UFC... Um, Actually, I don't either. Do you want, do you want to briefly okay, so explain what an, inspectors? So what an, inspect, what an inspector is, if you watch a UFC, you'll see... Uh, some oh, checking the official. face, the mouth guard, the gloves, Vaseline, all that sort of stuff? Um, well, they'll go into the cage with them and, right. and stand there and monitor them in the cage. Well, they don't just monitor them in the cage. They monitor them in the change rooms, make sure their toenails, fingernails are cut, make sure they've got a mouth guard, make sure they're not cheating by taking any um, performance-enhancing stuff. So they're there to monitor the fighters. Well, for the UFC in, in Australia and, and, and the, um, the Asia-Pacific region – I trained all the inspectors. So all the inspectors you see on the UFC are my inspectors, basically, in the Asia-Pacific region. region. Um, I've also got uh, two judges I trained and a referee I trained that's also UFC uh, and a timekeeper as well. So I trained a lot of officials for, for UFC, uh, for MMA, basically. And so I was on this show, Battlefield, I was. they asked me if I could supply a whole team, and I said yes. And... Um, this guy had a bad, a bad uh, credit rating already with uh, not paying fighters, and so just the fact that he had decided to contact me and ask for a whole team and was trying to do the right thing, I thought, I thought this guy's, you know, he was unorganised, but he's trying to do the right thing. And then, so when I decided not to go to the event, he actually rang me then and and, and said, "Look, okay, I I, I get it, I understand." And uh, then the event went ahead and people complained about the refereeing. And then I also heard that the fighters were not being paid once again, right. which is really sad because, you know, regardless of how much uh, bad publicity I cop, I'm all about the fighter. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, um, uh, you know, I, when I go in, I, I go, okay, I do a UFC. My, my, my minute of fame is when Bruce Buffer goes and your referee Steve first of all I get to wave <laughs> I get to wave to the camera and then it's all business. I, I don't I don't I don't care where the camera is, I don't care what the people say, I just do my job and that's that's what it's about. Uh, people people don't don't think I do that, but that's what I do. That's that's what I'm all about. What do you think about some of the fights? Um, you know, in you mentioned being up in Brisbane, which I think is where where the first uh, Mark Hunt Bigfoot Silva fight happened, which was which ended up winning Fight of the Year and is still pretty well regarded. Um, are there any particular fights that stand out to you, or where you're sitting in there and you're just sort of going like, whoa? Well, I ref that fight. Yeah, no. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I mentioned a lot, it. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. <laughs> and, but that's, that's cool because that's what, that's my job. I do, I'm not supposed to be in the limelight because I ref that fight. So I ref that fight. Um, and I think that was, I think that was a great fight. Um, I was asked why I stopped the fight at a certain point to get Bigfoot checked. And so what Mark Hunt does, Mark Hunt goes forward and he, he starts hammering someone and then he steps back. So during this fight, I was watching this, this blood come out of Bigfoot's head and I was concerned about a cut. And so Mark Hunt's hitting him and Mark Hunt's decided to step back and I've gone stop. And as I've gone stop, Mark Hunt stepped back in and then I've had to pull him away because I've called stop, but you can't go stop and then let him continue because that's unfair to Bigfoot. Um, I got a bit of criticism over that, but but Mark Hunt stepped back, so that's when I called stop. And so then I I pulled Bigfoot away and said, I've got to get this cut looked at. And as I pulled him away and looked at his face, he breathed out, which sprayed blood all over my face. <laughs> so here I am in the cage with this with like a spray bottle of blood just sprayed my whole face, and I can't react. I just gone. Yep, come over here, 
And, uh, and the doctor's come in and looked at it and he said, no, he's okay. And then I've gone back and restarted the fight again. So some people thought I, I, I stopped the momentum of the fight with that, which I can, I can understand why they think that, but that's not the truth. If, if Mark hadn't have stepped back, I would never have stopped that fight. Um, and then, and then I did receive, you know, a lot of good publicity over that fight because a lot of people said to me, you know, a less experienced referee would have stopped that fight on numerous other occasions. And, um, I was close to stopping that fight on a few other occasions, but I let it continue and, and, uh, got praised for that. In a way. Do you have any reservations or I guess, you know, outside of the UFC, I assume that you probably wouldn't know a lot about the backgrounds of other fighters and their records, but, but somebody like Bigfoot Silva, Alistair Overeem is, a, is another guy where, you know, probably in their last seven or eight fights, they're all losses and they're all pretty brutal knockouts. Does that ever sort of weigh on the back of your mind when you know that history of, of a fighter of, of, how long you're going to let them continue in in a, in a potentially dangerous situation? Um, well, you, you know, I watch a fight and I watch the fight unfold and I watch the reactions of the fighter. And um, because a lot of people say, you know, oh, he's a he's a professional fighter, or even fighters say to me, "Look, I'm I'm a professional fighter. I'm tough. I can take it." And I'll say, "Yeah, I'm sure you're tough, but." You know, I'm going to stop it when I feel you're in danger, and so that's that's where I, that's my whole answer to anyone that talks about whether this guy's tougher than that guy or this guy's being injured a lot. I'll stop it when I feel that fighter is not defending himself or can't defend himself, and I'll usually say, "Fight back, fight back, loud as I can," and I let the fighter know if, I, if they hear me say that then I'm going to stop the fight. They need to show me they're still in the fight. So when I say that, if the fighter just covers up and stops and doesn't defend, I stop the fight. If I see the fighter as not intelligently defending himself, I'll stop the fight. If he's staggering a lot, dragging his feet, I'll stop the fight. So there's numerous reasons why I'll stop the fight. Intelligent, intelligently defending themselves. I, I want to ask mm-hmm. you a question about this because, in particular, sure. um, you know, one guy, Chael Sonnen, when he gets hit hard, he turtles up, and you know the fight's sort of over. He, he tends not to sort of fight himself out of that position. But when you yep. get other guys, um, like I was just watching uh, a, a clip of BJ Penn versus uh, Yair Rodriguez, and a lot of that is just sort of um, the, they're still getting belted. But they're using their feet to shrimp or sort of retain, but they're not, it's like they're not actively able to return themselves back to their feet. They're, they can just sort of use that to, uh, well, shrimp around or, or, or try to create as much movement to get out of there. Is that intelligently defending themselves? And I think you know where I mean. There's sort of a certain point where they're, they're still taking strikes and they're trying to move, but they're not, you know, actually returning to their stomach to get up from that position. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I know, I know that position very well. Um, and so you've got to look at how many strikes that fight is wearing on the head at that time, and um, what that's doing to him, uh, because it's you know they 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 they're potentially uh, causing concussion, and um, you know so if they're just wriggling around, uh, I'm going to give them a little bit of time in that situation, and uh, if they're not improving their position, then I'll I'll call a stop to the fight. And then the other one that, that tends to come up quite a lot is when someone gets hit and they seem to shoot in and maybe catch the, the single leg while they're sprawled out. Uh, if, if you know, they get sprawled on yep. while they're attacking yep. a single and then they, they tend to take, uh, hammer fists oftentimes to the side. And that yep. seems to oftentimes be a really, th- when they pop up and they go, look, you didn't give me a chance to finish that single or, or to finish a attacking forward or I'm still in it. Yep. Sure. Um, well, when, once again, when I ask to fight back, when I ask them to fight back, if they're just hanging on to a leg and not not doing anything or just covering their head, and I ask them to fight back, I I I can't in, I can't know what what they're feeling. So, um, the classic Herb Dean had a fight. I'm just trying to think who it was, where the fighter ended up almost in that situation, and the um, the, the person on top was just hammer fisting his head. And the other guy just did not do anything, did not try to improve his position, was just there covering sort of his head, and he was just copping punches, hammer fist, hard hammer fist. 
And then when Herb stopped the fight, he, he sort of stood up and said, what did you stop that for? Well, Herb's asked him to fight back and to improve his position, basically. Mm. You know, we can't see, we don't know exactly what's going on with that fighter when he's he's been rocked and he's gone down like that. We don't know if he's hurt, just covering up or not. So we we tend to shine on the side of caution with that. And um, so, you know, when he's not doing something that we asked, then we stop the fight. One of the uh, out of, it, it was a recent fight, but even still out of like, you know, 20 years of sort of watching this, one of the most, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, d- disagreeable or, or contentious, contentious is the word I'm looking for, oh, yeah. stoppages was, um, was Lawler yep. Askren. Maybe yep. what was that about six, six months ago now? Probably yep. somewhere around then. Yep. Well, you know, watching it, from from there, it it sort of it does look like Lawler's hand kind of falls, but as the break in the fight, he's obviously clearly still there. What, yeah, what, absolutely. What, you know, it, it's, it seems really disappointing because you know that that it, if it was a, been allowed to continue, that that fight was explosive right in the making, proved so to be within that first minute. Yeah, I, look, you know, I, I hear what everyone's saying, and that's all in hindsight, right? So when I see a fighter go unconscious, I move in to stop the fight. And if he bounces back, how, how the hell am I supposed to know how long he's going to be unconscious for? Um, I believe, I, I, I believe, I, I thought personally, as I watched that fight unfold in lifetime, not in slow mo, I thought he went unconscious. And then came and, back to, you reckon? And came back. That's what right, I believe. Okay. That's, that's what I think. Okay. Um, I, I, yeah, I thought, uh, I thought, I thought that was the right thing. I thought that was the right stoppage, although he sort of came back after he went limp. He sort of came back a bit almost straight away. Um, and I have seen that, you know, you, we talk about flash knockdowns and things like that where you, where they get knocked down and then they hit the floor and they bounce back and they're, they're awake again. And so I'll let, I'll sort of let the fight continue provided he's not taking unnecessary damage. And the same when, you know, I, I was confident. I, I was in China recently and I thought the guy went unconscious. His arm flopped down, but then he came back straight away as soon as I went to grab his wrist. And I was like, wow, I really thought he went out. And it was almost the same thing as um, what Herb went through. Let me ask the question the, the other way. Are there any calls that you regret or, or any decisions or things that have happened where you go, man, that you know, I, I shouldn't have done that? Um, oh, yeah, there's, there's, we all make mistakes. And the more fights we do, the more chance we have of making tiny mistakes. And I would say the mistakes I've ever made in, in a fight are fairly insignificant compared to what I've seen some referees do. But for some reason, because I'm an Aussie referee, I get ridiculed really badly uh, by the by some of the US fans and by my by the Aussie fans. And and I know that you know, and we can talk about the Hector Lombard Neil Magny fight. I'm I'm happy to talk about that, and I don't regret that decision. I but don't think dis- I think it was all right as well. I don't think it was excessive. Okay, well, the fight that I remember, and this is a, this is a funny one because I was in uh, Singapore, and and this fight show, I don't know, just a couple of. A couple of little things I did were just not right, you know. And Brian Stan, who was not a massive fan of me, was commenting and he, he didn't like me much. Um, and one fight I copped the kick to the groin, or so I thought. Anyway, so I broke him up, gave him some time. And it's the first time I ever did it, and it's the last time I ever did it. I looked at the big screen and watched the slow-mo replay. And as I watched it, I went, he didn't get kicked in the groin. So I went, you never got kicked in the groin. He was, uh, he was, I think he was Chinese, he was Asian. He couldn't understand me. I couldn't understand him. I said, you never got kicked in the groin. We're going to fight again. Fight. And so I started the fight again. Anyway, after the fight, when I came home, because I reviewed my fights, I watched it again, and he did get kicked in the groin. Right. Okay, so you just <laughs> so, had a bad camera angle? Is that? Sort yeah, of- I, I don't know what it was, but when I got home and I could see it, and I went, oh, my God, I made, I made a blunder on that. And, uh, so, so don't second guess yourself. Don't second guess yourself. Make the decision, and I only ever make the decision what I see. I don't make it. I don't. I don't preempt the decision making. Um, but I wrote a lengthy letter to Mark Ratner in the UFC, and I said, "Look, I got a few things wrong on this UFC, and I totally understand if you want to suspend me, and and I don't get a gig for a while." And I, I gave him a 
I, I, I caned myself over this. And, and Mark, Mark come back and said, Oh, we're really worried about you. You know, like, <laughs> don't worry. Relax. It'll be all right. Is, um, uh, I remember Ratner cause, cause he used to be part of the, the boxing commission. Then he ended up getting yep. hired into the UFC. Is he, is he still yes. with them or what's his role with them now? Yeah. He is the vice president for international. International, oh, 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 I can't think of the word. Is it associated with like uh, doping or rules though? No, no, no. It's, yeah, he's like, he's the man that goes into uh, the commissions that are around the world. And he, so he's like the international USADA or something along those lines? No, no, no. He's got nothing to do with the drugs. He's the one who helps, helps the governments understand what the USC do and the rules, Re- regulatory affairs. He's the vice president for international regulatory affairs. Gotcha. So a lot of people don't realize that when, when the USC go to a country like China, there is no commission. And what a commission is, is basically in Nevada, they have a commission where they, the Nevada Athletic Commission will, will, um, will organize the officials for the USC and they will do the weigh-ins, they will conduct the weigh-ins or do everything associated with making sure that UFC is running correctly, sanctioned, we say. Um, when they go to countries like China or Korea and there is no commission, UFC become the commission. Now, UFC run exactly the same. They're like the McDonald's for uh, MMA. Everything is exactly Brutality. the same. Yeah, well, yeah. well, everything's exactly the same as if they were in a state in the U.S. Okay. And it's always run like that. They never run anything different. So there's always drug testing. And I'll tell you, you I, I give UFC a lot of credit for that because they do everything by the book as if they were sanctioned by an out, out, outsourced uh, organization like a commission or something like that. So what do you think then? I'd, only because we're taking the conversation there then. And again, I, I only get to read this as an outsider in MMA media, but you hear a lot of um, the way that – I mean you're talking about commission stuff. I'm going to take this into into the doping aspect because you see a lot of mm-hmm. fighters, certain fighters who are who are caught as cheats or breaking the rules who are then kicked out. But then of course there's a different set of rules for your Brocks, for your Connors, for your for your John Joneses. Uh there seems to be some overt favoritism being played towards the superstars of the sport. Do do you you reckon you don't see it that way or am I just sort of gauging this incorrectly? Um, I honestly don't know, Sue, because the Doping Commission is a completely separate organisation to the UFC. So the UFC have no say in who gets drug tested. Uh, so what happens at a UFC is um, a fighter will be walking back from the cage and, um, and they get they'll say, okay, right you, away, they? yeah, you got to get tested. So it's random testing. Um, initially, every every fighter was drug tested, did a did a um, can I say a piss test, uh, before they fought at the UFC, every fighter. Now USADA have complete control over it. They just pick and choose who they want to do the test, and then and then they will pick and choose who they want to do the test after the fight show as well. Let, let me make my question more particular and just see if you know any insights on this. I think this happened with John Jones twice. One of the Daniel Cormier fights, I believe, where, as you said, they, they piss test them beforehand, and I believe the results were revealed before. No, they knew the results of it before the fight, but the fight was still allowed to go on. And they knew that he had tested positive for one of these banned substances. I don't know if you read about that story, but I don't expect you to know anything of it. But perhaps you're someone that can shed some light on this if you do. I, I don't really know much about what happened with that fight. But, you know, um, I think John Jones was... Uh, um, was it uh, was um pinged for recreational drugs and so i don't know if it really had anything to do with performance enhancing drugs i'm I, I, i'm not really sure about that um so i i don't know what what the situation with that was um okay uh, and no worries. I, I just yeah i can't answer on that one sorry um Look, we're probably getting towards the end of the conversation, so we'll just start again. Uh, I said before we turn on the mic, there's a couple of interesting questions that I wanted to ask you. And I think anyone who's uh, who runs a gym or trains in it, has who's been there for a while, has seen the oddity of characters and the people who 
who seem to be really far from mentally stable walk through their doors at, at one point in time or another. Mm-hmm. There's got to be a couple of these stories that you have of just um, lunatics who, who have decided Absolutely. that they're going to be the next heavyweight champion, even though that they're a, a featherweight who who's uh, you know heel hooks and arm bars don't work on them because they're they're mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, every time uh, every time there was a UFC, um, we would get an influx of, of, of people wanting to be a UFC fighter in the gym. And um, I remember two guys coming in, sitting with their arms crossed, watching my jiu-jitsu class, and they sat there with a, with a, you know, just a straight stare on their face. And I walked over and I said, hey, guys, how can I help you? And they said, we're thinking about doing jiu-jitsu. We train MMA. And I said, all right, okay, cool. And um, I said, well, why don't you join in the class? And they said, well, we can't, but we'll be back next class. And I said, sure. So they came back in the next class, came in late after I'd started class. And I said, just go, because I've got two training floors. And I said, just go next door, just warm up a bit, and I'll come next door. And they're warming up. And I took I took one of my purple belts and a brown belt at that stage next door. And I said, so – what are you guys doing? Show me your stuff. And they, they tried to take down on each other and I'm watching it. And I said to you, to my two guys, I said, you guys just go wrestle them. And I just walked next door because it was absolutely atrocious. And when I asked them, when I asked them, where do you train? They said, in our garage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But I've got a, I've got a better story than that. I had a guy many, many years ago back in the, back in the 2000s. He came to my gym and he walked straight up on the floor while I'm teaching a Hapkido class and said, hi, I'm here for jujitsu. And I went, mate, I'm teaching a class. Go and, <laughs> go and sit down over there and wait for the jujitsu class. And he went, okay. And off he went. Anyway, so I shook my head and continued on. Afterwards, I started my jujitsu class, at which point he joined into the jujitsu class. And he was making all sorts of weird noises as he was just drilling. And I went over to him and I said, mate, are you okay? And he said, yeah. I said, well, what's going on? What are you making these noises for? And he said, that's just how I train. Okay, sure. Anyway, so then we had a break and I said, okay, everyone take a break. And this guy was running at the, one of my punching bags and just, <laughs> just running at the punching bag, jumping at it, hitting it and falling down onto the ground. And he did this three times and I went, hey, hey, hey. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just, practicing. And I said, what do you mean you're practicing? And he said, I'm just practicing. And he kept on running to hit this bag. I said, stop, stop. I said, stop doing that. And he said, oh, okay. And I scratched my head again. And then when I looked at him again, he was laying on the floor. Imagine um, you've stunned a cockroach and they're upside down <laughs> on their back and they're wriggling their legs. And this is what he was doing. I said, mate, come here. I said, mate, I can't have you here. There's something, there's something not right. <laughs> and he said, oh, okay. And so he left. Anyway, as I spoke to one of my other students at the time, he said, I thought that guy was weird because as I drove up in the driveway, here he was jumping in your auto bin. <laughs> what? He was in my auto bin jumping up and down. You know, an auto bin, a wheelie bin? Yeah. And I said, what did you say to him? He said, I said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm just crushing down the rubbish. <laughs> Just working himself up, working himself so, up. What the hell? I, and I thought this guy, this guy is a plant. This guy, is, there's something sus about this guy whatsoever. How, how long <laughs> have you been running your gym for now, Steve? Um, I started this gym in Penrith in 1995, um, which was uh, initially Hapkido. Then I turned it into Jiu Jitsu. So my Jiu Jitsu game is a very old style game because of my um, slow learning from doing seminars. I, I have a very, I have a good side control because that's all I knew for, like, two years, just to hold people in side control. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I love I still love it. I, I still hit the mat. I still love it. But, you know, of course, I'm not very competitive now, especially with the young guys coming through, very strong young guys. Oh, I mean, find them the same thing as, as I was saying right. before we started on. You just – these guys walk on the mat and for – you know, they – they haven't worried that they don't even worry about doing a, ni- a knee slice because they're just attacking your legs immediately. <laughs> it's yeah, just, yeah. Well, well, we used to teach triangle at blue belt, triangle choke at blue belt. Now people walk in knowing triangle choke because they've seen it on UFC. So, you know, there's so much more education out there and, and, and foot locks, you know, they're just such a common thing now. Mm. Just so common. 
So I, I got to tell you a funny little story. Uh, every month, every month for the past three and a half years, I go to China and I referee a big show over there just for TV. It's called the WLF, and it's um, it's 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 big over there. So um, I'm I'm. I'm about to start the show, and in walks Forrest Griffin because he's now with the UFC, the Institute in Shanghai. And he comes in, and he says, I'm just here to check out the fights and maybe see if there's any fighters that want to come over to the Institute. And I said, sure. So he sat there all night watching these fights. Um, we, we can ref anywhere up to 28 fights in one night. And so he's sitting there watching it, and I'm talking to him and take, take him a couple of bottles of water and up. And then at the end of the night, I said, listen, let's get a photo. So we jump up on the stage and we, we get a photo together. And while we're doing this, a bunch of, a huge amount of Chinese people come around and they're just staring at us. And when we step down off the stage, they all gravitate to me to get photos with me. They actually didn't have a clue who Forrest Griffin was. <laughs> That's all right. That's cool. Take your level of fame and run with it. (laughs) But I I said to Forrest, I said, excuse me, Forrest, while I go to my fans, and he just (laughs) chuckled. But it's just, for me, that's astounding. And for you, that would be astounding because here is a UFC legend, and they did not know who he was Mm. because they don't know UFC. They don't know the UFC over there. They might now, but they don't know UFC over there because of all the, the blocks on, on media and things like that, social media and YouTube. Oh, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that aspect, of course. But, but, but they knew me because they just saw me riffing in the cage, so I was famous to them. <laughs> where, um, so, where do you think Chinese MMA is sort of in its, uh, in its evolution at the moment? Oh, wow, it's, it's going pretty good, I'll tell you. You know, um, uh, I, about five or six years ago, I went over there for the Ultimate Fighter China series, and, and, um, they were terrible. They were just terrible fighters, and I had no doubt, no doubt in my mind that any local show Australian fighter would clean up over there. Now, the winner of that series, one of the winners was uh, Jiang Ling, who just fought in Shenzhen last week and won. Um, now, I have no—he he would have been beaten by any Australian fighter. Now, in those last five years, that guy has has made unbelievable uh, progression in MMA. He is so good now. I mean, he's on the world stage and winning. And, um, and the Chinese, the Chinese fighters, the evolution is, uh, coming along really rapidly because they're bringing in a lot of Russians to train them, a lot of Brazilians to train them. And on the show I work on, they are, there's some very, very good Chinese fighters on that show and, uh, they're progressing very well. So I think in the next, in the next 10 years, you're going to see quite a few more Chinese fighters coming through and be very competitive. Um, so I think, I think it's a big thing. And, and that's what the UFC like. They like that idea that there's going to be Chinese. It's a huge, huge market. Um, but in saying that, we also see a damn well lot of, um, Russian fighters who are just beasts. Um, so yeah, we're, we're watching, we're seeing some really good fights over in China at the moment. It's it's a it's it's really good. It's really good. Let's start bringing this back home as we begin to wrap up. Um, <clears throat> we've been talking about a few. Uh, well, well, the Australian talent that you've had the chance to run into. I, I want you to share some stories about some of those guys. But one name that while I was jotting them down that stands out to me is is Kyle Noak. Uh, oh yeah. Noak came from from CFC. Um, he he still has a very memorable knockout that I remember from the UFC where he throws that teep kick into someone's guts and I think knocks him out yep. there in, in the first round but yep. um, it's it's not very well known that Steve uh, Noak was a grappler who I believe oh, was no. Steve Irwin's bodyguard for a number of yeah. years and Steve yeah. Irwin was also a big fan of MMA and UFC do you have any stories or do you encounter um, them during this time period or anything that you can share about that sort of relationship with those two? Um, with Kyle definitely uh, Kyle you know uh, like with a lot of these fighters I've watched them come come up, you know, like Kyle Noak, Rob Whitaker, uh, Richie Walsh. There's so many of them. Um, but Kyle, uh, Kyle is such a nice, quiet, quiet person, you know. And it's funny because I've ref Kyle Noak and I refed him in that fight. That was against Peter Sabota in UFC 193. And he pulled that front kick out and Sabota just collapsed and mm. then took a couple of hammer fists to the head before I stopped it. Um, 
But uh, Kyle is a very genuinely nice person, as are all of them, really, to be honest. And uh, such a such a, a good ambassador for the sport. And you know, so if I go to when I go to talk to Kyle in the change rooms, if I'm refing his fight, he he you know he's glazed over, he's just focusing on what he's got to do. He listens to me. And then after the fight, he'll say, "It was so good to see a a, a face that I knew." And um, he's he's very responsive like that after the fight, after the fight, which is really good because that's what I like. But yeah, he was he was the bodyguard of Steve Irwin, and um, and I don't know much about them, but he you know he fought a lot on CFC, and I refed him a lot. And he was once again the integrity of that sort of person is is really good. You know they're really good guys. Same as Rob Whitaker. I ref Rob Whitaker probably more than anyone else. Just a good, humble guy. In my opinion, one of the best rounded fighters of all time. To be honest, and a lot of people say who's the best fighter, and everyone goes John Jones. Mate, have a look at Rob Whitaker. He has fought everyone. Jack Souza, Yon Romero, he, uh, he just fought everybody. And just, just, when you think he's, when you think, oh, he just can't win, he just comes through and wins. He's just such a good fighter. Well, it's interesting that you mention that because like it's, and it's also surprising because as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's a sparsely populated country and it's surprising who you get to see. So I, I got to see Rob Whitaker fight on a CFC card before he was who he was. And I remember he just, he appeared to be this impressive fighter who, cause, I think you'd agree with me. As you see guys coming up, there's a big discrepancy in being able to merge your stand up with the transition to get them to the ground. Either it's, it's shooting like a one, two from really punching one, two and then trying to, trying to get that shot or alternately good stand up without the defense. And he, even at that point in time, he seemed to be able to merge those two worlds of, um, uh, of, uh, not even the grapple, um, the clinch rather, the stand up and the yep. clinch phase to get it to the ground. Yep. Seeing him, and then I remember, um, another name that you'd remember is, is Ben Power from, um, from Paramount Gym. Yeah, and, yeah. And we went to, um, there was some f- event that was happening at Sydney Olympic Park, and I think it was being headlined by Kyle, um, you got me saying Kyle Noak, but I, I'm thinking <laughs> of, um, uh, what's his name? Used to, used to be in the UFC around that time when, um, he fought Justin. Uh, I'll have to come back and he's, he's really much a journeyman fighter now. Um, ended up on strike force. And, but anyway, he, uh, Ben Power was telling me, you got to watch out for this, for this American wrestler who's come on the scene. People are telling me that he's going to be really, really good. And this was, uh, this was DC. It was Daniel Cormier. And I remember oh, for, yeah. like the three rounds that he was in there, he was yeah. just, um, high crotch in this guy. Wasn't even really striking him. Was literally just picking him up and throwing him around the ring for, yeah. I don't think it got out of the first round of it, but, um, it's really interesting where you see these guys, and I assume you must see that too, of how you see these guys come up through their career from from having 20 people watch them on a prelim to headlining a card. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've refed some fighters. I'm watching a UFC at home, and I'm sitting there watching it, and I think, I think I've refed that fighter, and I'll go in and research it, and I'll go, oh, yeah, I refed him. You know, like, I, I've been very fortunate. You know, I, I got to ref – I got to ref – um um, Uriah Faber and, and Frankie Edgar, you know, I've ref Whitaker so many times. Um, you know, I've just, I've just managed, I've just been lucky enough. I ref, uh, Joanna, mm-hmm. uh, um, and, uh, Valerie Latorno in UFC 193 for a title. Mark Hunt versus Bigfoot and Josh Barnett, you know, I've ref so many good guys and, and, um, and it's it's I, I think it's a real privilege and an honour to be able to to do that for for me that is, um and, and uh, you know you haven't you didn't ask me about the booing but that's okay um I'm, let's talk about know. that then <laughs> <laughs> it's it's kind of funny I I I kind of laugh at, well I do laugh about it I think it's I think it's hilarious and and um I think the Australian audience don't even know why they're boo- booing me anymore but they just join in and boo me. <laughs> well, there you go. It's, it's a sign of affection then, or perhaps you're the, well, you're, you're the tallest of the poppies at that point in time. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably one of the most hated referee. Well, I don't know if I'm really that hated, but you uh, know, there's, um, there's Mazzagati. Oh, we didn't even talk about Cecil Peoples who, uh, who I, I think he's literally just in there to watch people die. But, uh, oh, 
There's some, if you go on YouTube and watch some of his stoppages, they're hilarious. They're just hilarious. He, he literally runs in to, to stop a fight and the guy moves and he just jumps over the fighter and runs into the cage. It's, it's great. <laughs> but you know, like, um, look, a lot of, a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't know what I know. A lot of people who criticize me don't know what I know. Um, the, the Neil, the Neil Magny fight, Hector Lombard fight, a lot of people criticize me in that fight. Um, and have never asked me what actually, what went through my mind in that fight. And, and because I have an explanation for that fight. And now I rewatched the fight plenty of times and I stand by my decision. Um, ha- could I have stopped it? Absolutely. Uh, but I chose not to. And there's reasons behind that. And, uh, I've, Argued that I've argued that with other referees, and uh, I even asked Herb Dean's take on that, and he gave me his opinion, which he actually didn't criticise me for that at all. Um, there's some fighters. Uh, well, a- a- after the fights, the post-fight, one of the post-fight shows, uh, Brian Stan criticised me. Not, not he didn't attack me personally. He just criticised what I did, and I went, yeah, fair enough. I always take criticism. And um, Dan Hardy, who was also with him, said, oh, I have to disagree. I think the referee did this, 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 right? I've been in that situation. And I, I, that, that makes you feel good because, it, as I said, I don't make any decision based on anything except what's going on in that fight. And so all my decision came from, from watching that fight, where I was in that fight, who was in that fight, you know. So that's, that's how I did it. There's no preconceived ideas. In fact, I try and keep preconceived ideas out of my head. Uh, you know, like if a fighter's coming, if John Jones was coming in to fight someone, I, I don't go, oh, this is John Jones, it's going to be a quick fight. I just, it's John Jones, he's blue, now he's just a blue fighter, and this guy's a red fighter, I'm just watching that fight as it as it, as it unfolds. Fair enough. Uh, hmm. Well, look, I think that's a pretty good place to leave it off. We covered um, covered a lot of ground today. Great, thanks, Jesse. <laughs> I, I, I do talk a lot. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's the whole point. I, you know, hopefully hopefully we got people that want to that wanna hear it just like myself. Um, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, I think, as I said, I think you're sort of taking a, a backward step, you know, with after Rich Franklin and Jeff Sher on on your show, and you got referee Steve Percival who gets booed everywhere, you know. Um, but you know, I really appreciate the opportunity, and and I hope it does well for you because it sounds fantastic. You do a great show. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, you know, whereas as I said, it's um, you know, there's not many other sports that I follow that closely, so it's one of the few things that I actually know a little bit about, and it's yep. um. As I was saying to you before we started this, it's always interesting to talk to these people about what goes on behind the scenes because, um, y- y- you know, wh- you're talking about getting booed or other. These are always outside media perceptions of you. So I'm always interested to hear, you know, what's happening within people. And and there's a there's a large gamut of experience that happens long before you get to that point, which is, uh, yeah. you know, what we got to cover. And it's really good to hear some of these stories, as I said. So, you know, the, the Australian martial arts scene is is something that I sort of fell into, but out of, out of any scene, at least I know a little bit about it because we've seen the same guys come up through the scene and you would have more experience with me. So it's always good to, uh, to get a handle on that. And, um, you know, as, as you're teaching guys as well, you can go, Oh yeah, look, here's, here's the reason for that. And here's how this guy ended up here and ended up doing that. So it's, uh, it's cool. And I appreciate your that, time. That's exactly, that's exactly what I do. And, you know, like talking about traditional martial arts, you know, when, um, when um, when you saw the step off the cage kick to Benson Henderson, yeah, by and, Pettis, yeah, yeah, by Pettis, I was doing that in my gym back in nineteen ninety two, <laughs> stepping off the wall <laughs> and throwing a roundhouse kick. You know, a lot of I think now, doesn't that it, fall into pretty dubious territory of grabbing the fence, though? Isn't that in theory illegal? No, no, he's not grabbing the fence; he's stepping off the fence. So you can push off the fence. So you can push off the fence, you can walk up the fence, but you cannot hook your fingers and toes in to use that fence to your advantage. Mm. Okay. So there you go. All right. All right. I'm sure it's something else to, to create contention at, at some point. Although it's, yeah, well, um, it's really interesting the way that guys get around some of that. I, I'm, I'm disappointed sometimes the way that refs don't, don't call a, a point when, uh, when they grab the fence on the way to the, the takedown. Cause oftentimes, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think, uh, Overeem did that, he used to do that quite a bit when he first yep. got into it. And, and I just say like, look, you're, you're, you're keeping, you're keeping a 300 pound guy who, who just eats horses every day on his feet. You're taking away yep. the only advantage that people have from him. You gotta, 
as soon as he grabs that fence, the, the, there should be a restart on the ground. Well, well you, it's very hard to restart on the ground because you don't know where they would be positioned once they fell. But, but I agree with you. I take points all the time from people grabbing a fence, or, or if it's not such a big offence, take take them out of position at least. Um, and I took a point at, in Shenzhen off a fighter because he was hitting the back of the head, and he was underneath. So I didn't take him out of position because the fighter on top was still landing punches. So it's a real curly whirly of a of a rule that I knew, and and the UFC had to ask me about it afterwards because they didn't fully understand what I had done, and I had to take the point at the end of the round, and um, it didn't affect the outcome of the fight. But I warned the fighter twice about hitting the back of the head because he's underneath in a guard situation, hitting the guy on top and hitting him in the back of the head. Uh, the, so I had to deduct the point at the end of the round so that I didn't affect the fighter on top's position, didn't take away his advantage. Mm. So. The only one, uh, I just jot while you were talking, the, the most outrageous decision that I can ever remember happening at UFC is if you go back to, I think it was, it must be UFC 12. It was like rising in Japan. It's the one card, the one UFC card that Sakuraba showed up on. And Sakuraba was fighting uh, Conan Silveria, who's much better yeah. known as, uh, I think, is he's the ATT head coach, isn't he? Do That's I, right. Do yeah. I have that one correct? Them, yeah. 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 And I think um, they stopped the fight early while Sakuraba was doing his his traditional Yep. Uh, single leg, I'm going to take damage while I'm in here grabbing that single leg to get them on their back. And I think the fight was stopped. Yep. And they, his team caused such a ruckus that they refought that same night later on in the card, yeah. I think. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh. yeah, that's true. That's true. Anyway, that's just, that's, that's just one of those things, you know. <laughs> that's my last parting shot. So, All right, mate. Cool. Well, look, hopefully we'll see you. Um, uh, you know, I, I reconnected with you at, at Parosh's wedding. I don't even think you remembered who I was, but I was like, oh, I'd, l- I'd like to speak with you. And it's it's been a very good chat. And I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, mate. You're welcome to talk to me anytime, especially if there's something you need clarification on. If I can clarify it for you, please, please contact me. All right. Do you want to give out your telephone number publicly now? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should read some of my Twitter feeds. Thanks, mate. They, they, I don't think I want to give my phone number out there. I'll wait until was... they start calling you with the, the difference in time down under here when you're getting calls from continental USA. Oh, yeah. I don't worry. I've had plenty of people telling me from the USA I should hang myself and <laughs> things like that. Too kind. You know? uh, what, yeah. what, what, what great people they are. Anyway, yeah. I don't want you to do that, but I do appreciate your time and hopefully we can do this again soon. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you very much, mate. Too easy. Cheers.